this video was originally recorded at the annual Buddha and the Yogis retreat at Menla in Phoenicia, New York. To learn more about this annual program, please visit menla.us. Okay. Uh, yes, so on page four of the handout, of the, everyone should have now the right handout. In this told the storm of paper. On page four is a, a an invocation of Kali Devi from the Buddhist point of view. So that's the point of view, basically. She is, uh, she's the guardian of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and of Tibet as a whole. And when the Dalai Lama escaped from Lhasa in 1959, and he dressed as a soldier, you know, so that he would look like an ordinary Tibetan, like bodyguard or somebody, in case they were caught, slipping through the Chinese lines and at the Norbalinka Palace summer palace where he was residing uh, surrounded with all the Tibetans outside it and uh, surrounded. Uh, he had a thing over his back which looked like a rifle, but actually it was a tanka, a scroll icon of Penda Vamo nice. that only the Dalai Lama can look at. It's just uh, nobody else can see it. It's apparently very something. It appears and talks. And in our novel of the sixth Lama, it does a lot of things that he did. She comes out of it and she talks and stuff. So, so Kali has a great history in Tibet. And uh, she has these four forms. That this, this, uh, and her seed syllable is this Bhyo, which the, uh, which the Tibetans pronounce Jo. But I, I pronounce Bhyo. Very close to Jo. Okay, so let's chant this together to Kali Devi. And she has a soul lake, and it's her soul lake, what's called soul lake, Lhatso, in um, South Central Tibet, where um, uh, you go to see visions of the next incarnation of a great lama, particularly Dalai Lama, but other lamas also. And then you see visions in the lake. And they go there, they like called an oracular mirror, you know, like a magic mirror. And the present, the present Dalai Lama was house was seen there and some signifying syllables by Reggie the Pache, the, the um, a Lama regent Lama who was in, whose duty was to find the new Dalai Lama where he was born. You know, the lottery of like where, where the Dalai Lama gets to incarnate. So that's in Three David's soul or lake. And then the third Dalai Lama, in his autobiography, I, I thought it was so funny, he complains because when he died as the second Dalai Lama, he says, he found himself in uh, the Tushita heaven, in a Dharma center in the Tushita heaven, where Maitreya, the next Buddha, dwells until he comes to earth. And um, he teaches all kinds of things. And then all of the, a lot of the great um, yogis and scholars of the Buddhist history when they die, they like to go there and be with Maitreya, and then they have like an academy there. You know, they have like a Dharma center, and they discuss things. So Nagarjuna was there, Buddha Palita, Chandrakirti, all these people who were the idols, and Zonkapa, you know, the idols of the Dalai Lama. They were all there. And so he's like, oh, wow, you know. And he uh, wants to talk to them. And then after just a peek, you know, and he sees Maitreya, you know, of course, the seated Maitreya in his Dharma center. And then... And then Lamo shows him, says, okay, buddy, back to wait, let's go, we gotta go. And then she had a chariot with a, which had left a rainbow wink, and it was drawn by her mule, and she, which she was riding, but somehow she was drawing this like a, like a sled or a, a chariot. And um, he had to go and get in it because she told him, and she said, look, I know you're having fun, but it, a moment, a few moments here is years down there, and you're busy, you know, they, they're expecting you back into bed. <laughs> And then he goes to Padmasambhava's, no, he went to Amitabha's paradise, the, the, the Sukhavati, the bliss land of uh, Buddha Amitabha. He went there. And then that was amazing, you know, that's a really incredible, otherworldly, sort of really heaven like place. 
And again, just a brief glimpse, and then went back to the chariot, and then he goes to Gurumche, you know, uh, Padmasambhava's um, copper-colored mountain paradise, which is on Earth, sort of in the area of Madagascar, but nobody really knows where it is. Maybe, um, who knows, Congo or something. And the way it's described. And uh, she gets a, you know, he got a brief audience with uh, Gurumche, but then just hello and goodbye, and then he she drags him back, and then he gets reborn, and it was a what that would be, fourteen eighties five or something like that, you know, between that forty five to eighty six, and for him it was only a short time, because in these other planes, the time is they're very very different, so there they think they just said hello and walked around, and it's been years down here, anyway. But that's a little bit some of the stories in Colin. Actually, well, in Colin David's story, the, the Tibetans know of this form, Benda Lambo, uh, is that she was the favorite queen of a um, king in South India who practiced human sacrifice of captives from his wars of conquest. And then, um, or she became, I guess he, she was one of, part of his harem, and then she became the chief queen. And so then one day, uh, and she was the mother of the crown prince and so on, and so then one day she, she, she was given the honor, quote unquote, of bringing forth the, the captives to be sacrificed in his human sacrificial ritual. And um, she, instead of bringing the any captive, she brought his two children. <laughs> she was bringing them. He says, what, 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 woman, what's the matter with you? Like, where's the, where's the victims? Those are our kids. He said, yeah, well, all beings are our kids, you know, so we might as well sacrifice these. <laughs> At least we, we are the ones who missed them. And then he goes, oh, take this mad woman away, you know, and he's like, to him, almost like, he gets very angry and orders the guards to go and take away, take her away and protect his children and so on. And then she turns into this pendulum, the Kali Devi, riding on this mule that's made of eyes. It has eyes in its hips and legs and everywhere. And... Um, and then she's very, very ferocious, and then she, she um, I think, flays the sun in front of him. You know, guts and flays his son, their son, in front of him. Puts it on her mule as a saddle, somehow, miraculously or quickly. And then takes the daughter and has it in her teeth, has her corpse, the corpse of the daughter in her teeth. And he says, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I will, I'll stop sacrificing beings, it's okay, please come back, turn back into your beautiful self. She says, too late, buddy. <laughs> Bye. Not going to browbeat me with my children. Is there her natural creation or something? It's a really grisly story. <laughs> but somehow, a symbol of a powerful female. But she also has a peaceful aspect. She has a prospering aspect. She has a dominating aspect, which are white, uh, yellow, gold, and yellow, and red. And then she has that destructive, Kali, black aspect. So let's, let's read this, okay? On page six, page four. Byo, we begin by Byo. The mind core marks the four enlightened Let's go. The mind core marks the four enlightened activities. It does not exist elsewhere. Mind also exists not. Ultimate reality inseparable without color or form. You manifest just like a magical illusion, adapting to my mind, O oh, peaceful Sri Devi. Peacemaker, peace heroine, your very nature of peace, chief lady of the retinue of peace. Your symbolic color is a very pure white. I bow to you, O oh, peacemaking mother goddess. Please eradicate disease, demons, and obstructors. Yo, the mind core marks for enlightened activities. It does not exist elsewhere. Mind also exists not. Ultimate reality inseparable without color or form. You manifest just like a magical illusion. Adapting to my mind, O prosperous Sri Devi, growth maker, growth hero, your very nature growth. Chief lady of the retinue of growth, your symbolic color is a very pure yellow. I bow to you, O prosperous mother goddess. Please expand our lifespan and our merit. Yo, no, the mind core marks the four enlightened activities. It does not exist elsewhere. Mind also exists not. Ultimate reality inseparable without color or form. You manifest just like a magical illusion. 
adapting to my mind, O powerful Sri Devi, in power of power, ever in your very nature of power. She is the lady of the retinue of power, your symbolic color is a very passionate ruby. I doubt you, O dominating Mother Goddess, she is bring under my power all beings of the three realms. Then pure the mind for marks the four enlightened activities does not exist elsewhere. Mind also exists not. Ultimate reality inseparable without color or form. You manifest just like a magical illusion. Adapting to my mind, O ferocious Sri Devi, terrifier, terror heroine, your very nature terror, chief lady of the retinue of terror, your symbolic color is a very dark black. I bow to you, O terrifying mother goddess. Please fiercely free the disease, devils, enemies, and obstructors. Yo, though your nature is not at all self-established by thus appearing with such various natures, you accomplish beings aimed with the four activities, and we heartily praise you with intense attention. Let me effortlessly achieve the four activities, striving just like you for the sake of beings. That's a good one. They always like to recite that. That's a bit. Okay. Uh, back to business. Any questions about emptiness? Where is the Yavala? Yavala, any questions about emptiness? Today. Because that's what we're going to talk about today. You know, you're all transcendent renunciate yogis. You're all compassionate bodhisattvas. But how is your wisdom? Is that a question? Did you have a question? Um, or you were just stretching? No. Or you have a question? Right. Okay, just... Uh, yeah, right here. Where's your microphone? Uh, that's the first question? Huh? Where's the first question? Okay. What, what exactly are they talking about with the mind core? The mind I'm so core? sorry, what? When they say the mind core marks the four enlightened activities? Yes. Um, well, characterizes is like, you know, it says you can't chant characterizes. So marks. Uh, what that mind? What is the mind core? Uh, in the in the Buddhist uh, subtle science, the mind core is the super subtle wind energy, which is same thing as prana, but there's a super super subtle non-atomic prana, and that's the mind core, and that's what they also call clear light of the void. It's also the eighth level of dissolution. When the ordinary being reaches that point, what happens is they disconnect from all of the, all of the aggregates of their previous existence. And, uh, and that's actually the definition of death, actually, in, the, in Buddhist science. It's when, the, the, through those eight things that we just, I mentioned last night, you get to the bottommost one. But that is the mind core. And the difference between unenlightened and enlightened, both enlightened and unenlightened have the same mind core. The difference between enlightened and unenlightened is that enlightened is conscious of that mind core. So it can be conscious from a subatomic level, from the level where, where coarse reality, particles and atoms and so on, is, is uh, shapeable by that pure energy that has no particles, but is a much more powerful energy, it's like infinite energy. So that's the mind core. So... And it's, you know, words fail, mathematics formulas fail to really describe it because, as I think we said last night, although when you dissolve down into it, it's, it's, it's envisioned as if you reach the super microscopic, sub microscopic level of the heart chakra center, sort of the super soul center. And then as if you were going, just completely de detaching from all related relativities into like the microcosm, you could say. But then when you hit the microcosm, it's infinite. <laughs> it's like a thing in quantum. The quantum, some of the more adventurous quantum people have a concept, which they call the zero point quantum vacuum field or something like that. They combine those words in various ways to sound more or less horrific and incomprehensible. <laughs> And, and what they mean is this weird thing where a vacuum has infinite energy, mathematically. That they sort of, you know, their formulas and everything reach into saying that. It has infinite energy in a vacuum. It seems like a vacuum because the energy being infinite, it doesn't do anything. It's completely quiescent. But somehow anything that was consciously there could be both non-local and local. Trans-local and local both. 
primal phase. That's the Dharmakaya of the Buddha. What's called reality body of the Buddha. So mind core means Shri Kali uh, Devi, Shri Devi, you know, Penden Lamo, uh, Shri Kali Devi, Remati is one of another of her syllable names. Uh, she she is consciously shaped herself. She's the energy of Tara, which is miracle working, compassionate, and blissful energy. But she can shape herself in a destructive and fierce form if she if need be, if something needs to be transformed in that way, you know, like destroyed. Because it's never nothing's ever destroyed, it's just transformed. But on the material level it seems to be destroyed. So that's why they, this verse is begin these verses have a Madhyamaka and an emptiness idea in the verses. That's we are very perceptive to ask about before we look at the other thing. You know, so mind core marks the four enlightened activities. The four enlightened activities are activities of pacification, increase or growth, uh, domination, and destruction are the four enlightened activities. And the uh, rituals, you know, when they perform rituals, they can perform them in the different directions, in different colors associated with that, etc. You know, white, yellow, red, black, etc. And so, that the mind core is expressed in these enlightened activities. And it doesn't exist somewhere else. In other words, it's not like ultimate, absolute ultimate reality or the infinite energy of the vacuum is somewhere other than us. In other words, we are all of that. Like, you know, we go around like I'm like an old body, you know, with you know, flesh and blood and veins and hair and bones and whatever. So I go around thinking I'm that. But then, you know, on a scientific model, I'm like a bunch of molecules. And then there are some selfish genes running around there, and there's one or two enlightened parts running up there. A little bit like in the armpit or something. And then, <laughs> and then, uh, and then, then you go down, and then oh, they don't know what it is, because they don't know what that atom is. So then, scientifically, there's a wave particle paradox going on in my belly button. <laughs> and then, I almost, we obviously are all constituted of this pure light energy, which is kind of everywhere. But we are absolutely unconscious of that. And actually, if we have a flash of it, if we weren't expecting it, we would, might feel terribly threatened, like we're dying or something, or we're losing control, or we don't know who, what we are. And that's, it's a very scary sort of area that one can get into. And um, of course, normally I'm comfortable in being a flesh and blood body. Suppose normally, though, unless I have an auto accident or I'm dying or whatever, sick. So. So that's what the mind core marks. So that you know, we are acknowledging that you, Kali Devi, you are marked by, characterized by, uh, you, you're characterized by being pure clear light in action. In other words, you know, although it doesn't do anything to clear light, we're not saying you are the clear light doing something, but you can do anything. You can make a miracle by drawing on the clear light in any particular relational context where something needs to be done that requires maybe a miracle. So the mind core doesn't exist elsewhere. It's not like out of, your mind is not somewhere out of the universe. Your real mind, your real mind is what is made of all these things that are going on. What what constitutes it? And and mind understood in you know my mind, your personality structured mind doesn't even exist really. It exists not. It's ultimate reality, inseparable you are, in other words. You are the absolute inseparable from absolute reality, although you manifest relatively without color or form. And you manifest like a magical illusion. So like, like magical illusion doesn't have, of course, atoms, right? It's just like a vision or something, this idea. Like well, energy has no mass, right, or something. It's, but they all have that problem, those people. But you adapt to my mind, Oh, peaceful, Sri Devi. And here, is, here, one is praising the Sri Devi in her peaceful. She's very pretty in her peaceful form. She's white. She carries like the jewels and medicine, and flowers and things. And so you are the old peacemaking mother goddess. And please eradicate disease, demons, and obstructions in a pacifying way. Later, she has uh, well, the, the, the recitation as the powerful destructive one to destroy demons and enemies and obstructions. But here it's just to eradicate in the sense of remove them from any space where they would cause any trouble. And then that, those first four lines are repeated in each of her manifestations, in relation to each of her manifestations. So this, that's an interesting thing, actually. That also leads to another interesting point. Things like the zero quantum point vacuum infinite energy field 
are sort of all kind of abstract things like impersonal, like a mechanism or something, you know. Um, I mean, a material, like an object. Not, not normal material, but just an object. And uh, whereas, in a way, what is the, 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 in this infinite energy, what is the awareness of this infinite energy? Who is aware of that infinite energy? How do you access that infinite energy, for example, in your own meditation? From the, from the highest level of Buddhist science, normally made esoteric, you know, they say that the only way you do it is through bliss. And what bliss means, you melt away from your, the boundary itself that you normally are experience and defend and protect and carry around and heal and stretch and fix and improve and whatever. And uh, you, 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 there's a bliss of letting go of that. In a way, you know, there's a bliss of dying. People say when they come back from near-death experience, that, that when they finally let go, it was very blissful. You know, when they were fighting, struggling to maintain, it was very blissful. People who have simulated experiences like that, and yogis, great yogis, report such a bliss when they transcend their, their personal structured boundary itself into either what they think of as the great self, or what Buddhists would call the great selflessness, or sometimes they even say the great self of selflessness, just to get rid of any kind of notion of contradiction. And, uh, but that's a blissful experience. And the, 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 the deities that you see, like male-female union deities, are showing a kind of metaphor or a symbol of that bliss because in normal human life, a time of moving the boundary, it does happen in sexual experience <coughs> to greater or lesser degrees depending on people and how boundary they are insistent upon maintaining themselves and how paranoid they are about opening their boundaries. So, so that's, but, but, this, but the bliss of death or the bliss of entering the kind of clear light of the void or the, or the bliss of being voidness or recognizing that you are voidness, meaning pure relativity, is much, much more powerful than that. So therefore, people who think Tantra is just sort of some hot shot way of having sex, that's not correct, although there actually may be some side benefits, they say. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, I'm looking forward to that. And uh, so... Um, so yeah, so therefore it's bliss that, truly saying, it's bliss that finds the, that, that, that one is made of this thing by being able to identify with oneself as a vast, you know, unboundaried being. And without losing any part of it because it's vast and unbounded. So it doesn't mean that the person who experiences that, all this is impossible to explain, in binary language, still feels themselves in a way, yet they feel they're everything else at the same time. And, um, and that brings a kind of bliss. And, the, and then that bliss uh, is what uh, turns into compassion automatically, because that bliss includes, because it's a vision of relativity, it sees the bliss in all the other beings at the same time. It doesn't see just bliss over here because there's no boundary. So it sees everything, everything, and inanimate objects, even concrete slab or even artillery shell or whatever it is, is all made of this bliss energy, shaped in whatever really weird way. And that's the vision of a Buddha. But then the 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 sensitivity going with that expansive vision is that some sentient beings are not experiencing themselves as what they actually are. They are therefore deluded, they are ignorant, and that makes them suffer. So then, there's nothing for such a being to do, but, you know, like, what do you do? You know, you do the crossword puzzle. If you really have a free Sunday where you really have nothing to do, you know, you can't do anything. Well, you play, play Monopoly, you play Canasta, you play, like, what is that thing with the word, the language? You, know, you play a game. And uh, so the game is how can I unravel all these bees most rapidly so that they are, they are realizing they are bliss, they are entities of bliss. That's, that's the thing. So then she, being the great mother goddess, who therefore connects with what they call Dakini Jala, the network of Dakinis, 
the network of darkness is what sustains the world, actually. Whether or not the president is male or female. And the female might be more in connection with that network of darkness, which is why Dalai Lama said we need more female leaders. The only one left with really usefully functioning is Angela. She better win this poll. <laughs> I wish I could vote in Berlin, but I can't. And uh, because they're aware of this Dakini Jala Sambara, you know, then the mantra of Chakra Sambara, the sort of Shiva, almost Shiva like Buddha form. Om Shiva Jahe He Ruru Kam Dakini Jala Shambaram Swaha. So the great joy of all the Dakinis, you know, the, of all the network of Dakini, Dakini Jala. Jala means like a net. So, uh, so that's the thing. So she's so Kali is an active agent of that. Is is the praise, and then she is saluted in all her four forms, and then it ends by you know requesting her assistance with whatever positive activity that we have. What are you doing? You come and do all these crazy things, <laughs> huh? I buy myself, so I'm doing three oh, different things. I see. <laughs> Okay, so that's a good question. Any other question? Or on emptiness that we're talking. Yes, Diabola, what do you have to say? Is there really a, good. Is there a What's your question? Is there a particular Here, wait for the microphone. Here comes Emma. Is, is there a particular uh, role for the body in understanding or coming to emptiness in this tradition, other than understanding that it too is absolutely How relative? do you feel bliss when you feel, when you feel it? You feel well. In your body. Oh, so there might be some job for the body. Is there a spe specific bodily practices? In, What's that? Is there specific bodily practices in of the course. tradition? That's what we're talking about. But the foundation of it is emptiness, relativity, is the foundation. That's why we're talking about emptiness now. Because the idea of this, uh, you know, when you practice the esoteric teachings, you, the one thing you cannot do is you, you, or you have to be able to do, is to remove your sense of confidence about what you think of as the real reality. Like this reality, the meat, or meat space, what my friend Barton Perry Barlow calls meat space. You know, the sort of electronic frontier people, they call it meat space. So, um, uh, you have, I forgot my, what sentence I was making, I got like sidetracked. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. So, so uh, well, I totally lost track of my momentum there. <laughs> totally. Was what was I talking about? Bodily practices and how. Oh, bodily practices. Uh, well, yeah, no, because yes, then you, which means that you do something called creation state. Ultimately, in the in the lower, what I call the more preliminary tantras, uh, they don't call it creation states, but actually all of the the preliminary sort of lower order of tantras. Is involves visualizing something in front of you. And so what you're doing is you're taking your routinized imagination. Because Buddhist epistemology says, you yourself, you're visualizing your beard. You're visualizing your own limbs. You're visualizing your meat space entity. We are imagining ourselves all the time. That's why we're tired at night, because you have to constantly imagine it all. And it's through the model of it that we imagine, that we transmit, Signals like wiggle your fingers, you know, and by being, and actually, Hatha Yoga, Hatha, left, right, or right, left channel, Richard will correct me, I forgot which is which, you know, Hatha Yoga is a, a sort of, without putting one into the formal practice of it, involves re envisioning one's muscles and legs and things, etc., in a sort of energy flow open pattern rather than in the usual cramp thing. So that's a, but that's a small degree of what. The advanced things are when you're dealing with your chakras and things where you really get into the actual formal tantra, where you sort of start working in your brain, in your subtle nervous system, your whole body is your brain also, not just your head, your, your head part. There's a lot of wetware in the head because four of the five senses are located, located in the head. Uh, you know, but but there are the other senses all over the surface of the body. So that's why there's more wetware there, but there was wetware all over the body. 72,000 nadis, or channels, they say, based on the number of petals of the lotuses in the different chakras that in most systems, there are different systems because it's software. It isn't like you can dissect yourself and find a lotus someplace, like creeping around under the, under the, the Ganesha belly that Richard helps you find. <laughs> and, uh, 
and, uh, and it wouldn't, you wouldn't find it if you dissected yourself. But you, you're, there's a neural system there, and then you program that neural system uh, with these different loads. That's why there are different systems. And, but to, make, to be able to do that with power and realistically, you have to undo the sense of realism of this, which we all are definitely totally convinced. Meet, in meat space, we think this is just it. We're here in meat space, and that's it. And even vegetarians are here in meat space, of course, to that. It was their own meat, you know. They are feeding with vegetables. <laughs> right? So, and of course there's a role. But what is the body? As I just said, what we really are is this light. We're all light. And then what is light? They don't know because it goes everywhere. Its mass becomes infinite <laughs> when it gets going. And that's what we are. And we don't even have particles. We all have Buddha bodies. When they say Buddha is a, has a body, Buddha bodies have no particles, they mean that he himself is conscious of that. We are not conscious of that. We are identifying at a level where it's, it's more solid. Although, that also may be by design of the network of Dakinis, actually. Why? When you, you, when you go in meditation, a sensitive person, who feels pain upon merely stubbing their toe on the side of, a, of the door or something, you know, or a, a, a piece of furniture. Uh, if we, when we get in meditation in these planes of quite blissful, because there are orders and orders of bliss, and sort of golden realms and juicy things, then we would like just go there. We'd never, we try never to leave. And then, in those places, we, can, we can't really figure out the whole larger scheme of relativity because, you know, we can't relate much to other beings because we don't bang into them. And we don't touch them. You know, the, whole, the body, the human body especially, is very interlockable with other bodies. You know, very much built for relationality. That's why and completely deprogrammable and reprogrammable. Anybody can become a mass murderer, or and a demon, or an angel and a saint. That's the, and the human sort of is the middle place between that, depending on how what they how, what they cultivate. And, wh and why, when a being becomes truly what I call an evolutionary being, whereas if they realize that every moment they're evolving one direction or another, there's no idling. The engine of evolution never idles. To, to, to borrow a phrase from Wittgenstein. And so, uh, then one becomes super conscious of like everything one does and tries to make it all beneficial in, at whatever level, right? So, so, there, so there's a reason we're here, it's kind of. In other words, that's why it's better to be here than some Brahma body deity. There are 16 levels in the form realm according to Buddhist science, cosmology. 16 levels in the form realm of different, what they call Brahma Kaika Devas, bodies with Brahma body bodies, uh, de deities. But they like this loaf around. They don't go at 5 o'clock for, you know, personal practice, uh, Mysore style, house, <laughs> bed, oh, sleepy, or oh, what's my coffee? <laughs> they don't do that. They don't need that. They just lounge around like a bunch of golden energy whales. <laughs> and then they said, oh yeah, well, someday I'll go, oh yeah, someday I'll go be, be, become a Buddha somewhere, maybe, yeah. But that Buddha's cool, he likes a drama, a head drama likes him, etc. Okay? So, but back to emptiness. Another question on that topic. Anybody? Okay. So the verses I'm talking about is this one. A we, we, you know, I have, page I have a seven. I have a question. What? Oh, there's a question. Oh, yeah. Um, so, you were talking last night about Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Yes. So, how is, isn't that bliss? Isn't that the bliss that you just spoke about? Could be, kind of. I think somebody who really wanted to get away from it all, if they, if they as interpreted, now, Richard mentioned, we were talking about it, as interpreted. As interpreted as a, as a, as a having left the world behind which could be the difference between Advaita and Advaya. 
Advaita is the past passive participle. Advaya is an adjective, means non-dual. Advaita is, is said to be non-dual, but actually, literally, it's undoubled. Is what it more literally means in English, undoubled. Meaning that there's only that one reality. And the other reality is not real. This is a Brahminical tendency. Because there are all these lower castes, which are a lot, much larger percentage of people. And throughout Indian history it has been so. Which one becomes trained from a young age not to notice their condition. So the idea that non-duality means that you and they are of the same caste in some spiritual sense ultimately, and all animals and everything, you know, even though they are less fortunate in this life than you, that is not comfortable to the to that. So therefore, if Nirvikapa Samadhi is defined as a final departure from the ordinary world, then that is a problem, isn't it? As far as compassion goes. And maybe, therefore, it's a different bliss. There is a bliss, I mean, when you get away from it all, ah, they're not bothering me. I'm so blissful, I'm so happy. Nobody's bothering me. But then there's a, then there then when you get in the zone when you're doing whatever you really love to do, when you get into the zone, then you have a kind of bliss where you're interacting with all sorts of things and the and the blissfulness that you feel overrides whatever irritations are present. So non duality really is looking for that. I mean I don't know whether either is truly possible, since I haven't attained them, at least not in my own awareness. I might be one of those beings who did attain and then purposely forgot about it in another life in order to be more stupid again. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I might be. But that doesn't do me any good. Well, I have a question. We don't have to yeah. fuss about it. Okay, okay, yes. Another question. One more question. Um, in terms of the breath that we were studying this morning, where in the breath cycle do you find emptiness? Is it at the end of... Where in the breath do you find emptiness? Yeah, where in the cycle of breath, um, the breathing oh, in, breathing out, question. do you find emptiness? I don't think any one particular place more than another. But, uh, if you include in the cycle of breath what, what um, uh, tantric yoga does, which they call it uh, Vajra, Vajra repetition or Vajra recitation, Vajra japa. And then they include, there are three moments in the breath. There's the moment when, the, when you've inhaled and then where you, before you turn to exhale. So there's a pause there. And that pause is amplified. And in that pause, they say, is the plane of speech. And you know, that's the red ah. And we, we might do that together. And then, and then you, so when the breath doesn't move, then discursive thought doesn't move. So there's a moment of nirvikalpa, actually, when the breath doesn't move. Even though it feels uncomfortable to hold that, and then it overrides just like it's uncomfortable to hold the breath and one wants to get some air, some oxygen. But, uh, but vikalpa, which means mental construal, construction, you know, like discursive thought, um, is, uh, goes with breath, so when you hold it, it doesn't, um, it doesn't flow. The, the, the amount of the thinking is not there, so the thinking diminishes. There's still subtle energy movement, and that may call, enable thought, which will dislodge that, that holding. Uh, and of course, if one holds one's breath too extremely, without first having undone the grantas, you know, what, are, what yogis call the grantas, the knots in the central nervous system, then it will, you'll just choke and whatever, have a spasm or something. But if you have opened the central nervous system and the central channel, the Avaduti channel, Sushumna channel, the, uh, different names for it, then, uh, then you, you will, that way, you enter the central channel, that's the ultimate goal. That goes through the ah, uh, the ah uh, sound. It has a at the end of it, and it's a long ah, uh, and it's ruby color. So, so I would say that is where you kind of are approaching 
a kind of non-discursive experience, non-conceptual experience of something in the holding. But, but basically, you shouldn't privilege that in the sense that all three are equally emptiness. So you have to first get emptiness inferentially. That's why, that's why all the, why Dalai Lama frustrates people in so many audiences in the West, including Ardina and other people. And he starts going on and on about the table, the leg of the table, and the, all of these like picky things. And he reads these difficult things because he wants people to study. You know, rather than think it's just, oh, I'll get that, and then that's fine. They have to learn and study, right? So he's always doing that. So that, so, okay, so is that helpful, yeah, temporarily? And, um, and now we come here. Who sees the inexorable causality of things, of both cyclic life and liberation, and destroys any objectivity conviction, thus finds the path that pleases Buddhas, or victors. Okay, that verse is where we're beginning. Now notice, remember I said in the, yesterday, I guess it was only yesterday, about how the only worldview thing that you, see, you could say is like an orthodox belief in, er, in, the, in, every level, in the primary level of Buddhism is belief in causality. And remember I said why, because causality means relationship and means everything we observe is caused. And then, therefore, but our ignorance and our delusion is that there's something essential about us that is uncaused. Which you see, if you put your focus on that, and you have Nirvikalpa on that, if, what, what is your good name? You ask that question. Robin. Robin. So if you put your focus on that sense of yourself as something separate from everything else, and then you Nirvikalpa become one point where you don't think, then you naturally will have an experience of being absolutely separate from everything. Then that, then that will be a kind of bliss if you don't like, you know, washing dishes and you know, whatever, you know, some problems in life. And uh, there's a kind of happiness or a joyfulness in that maybe, but it's boring and lonely too, long time. Might not be the higher bliss of which things are made. It's an attempt to escape from interconnection. And, a, and emptiness means there is no escape from and it's more, if you were taken more radically, it means everything is empty of anything separate. And it means we are empty of being anything separate. We are all just interfolded with each other, in fact. Uh, and, and other beings and physical objects. And things. Okay? So, who sees the inexorable causality of things just means that that's someone who has achieved a kind of level where they kind of, you know, they've had this kind of funny slippage of that sense that, you know, the sort of central core program, you know, the CPU of their being at the heart level, the heart chakra, is, is like wrapped around some kind of unchanging, permanent, absolute little thing, which is their identity. And they've, that, they've had a, some experiences where that has seemed to slip and they have not repressed or gotten in denial about that that slippage actually gave a certain ease. And they had a moment of actually pleasure at that sense of slippage, but also fear. And then, but they didn't act on the fear of sort of clamping it down and then like living in denial, but in a way they had a slight visceral experience of selflessness, you could say. Okay? So this is someone who's had a little bit that is not in denial, and therefore sees the inexorable causality of things. And the, among things, the word for things here is the word dharma, actually. Because the word dharma, the great masters in India, great sages and scholars, they, they are 11 meanings of dharma in the Sanskrit dictionary. And the most basic one is a thing. And uh, just a cipher, you know. And it could be a thing like a liberation. My liberation, if I'm looking for one, I'm thinking I'm going to find that. On my nirvana, I'm going to find that nirvana. So, at some level, although mediated indeed by concepts, but anyway, even nirvana is a thing when, when we use the word or when we think about it. So, it's a dharma in the sense that it has its own characteristic. And so, causality of things, so, so that's why they can say things of both psychic life and liberation. So here is within Buddhism, not, now they're not critiquing a Vedantan idea of a ultimate state being a separation from everything. 
but they're critiquing a notion of liberation of a, of a dualist Buddhist uh, Theravada person or Hinayana person. There are other branches of Hinayana than Theravada who, who thinks that they've, they've got a nirvana that they got and they tasted it and then after they die they'll go back there. They might hang out now for a while on sort of this momentum, habit momentum, but they've seen the, where they're going and it's a place apart. And they're stuck on that. And they, they and that, and because they've seen it and they feel other people haven't, they're a little bit devil they care in their sort of residual life. They tend to be. You know? they tend to be like, oh, well, I'm different. And they know they're going there. So in a way, they're like a good old modern materialist who are sure they're going to be this, this is not exist. As far as relating to anything, there'll be no consequence. So therefore, they can do anything they like, like you know, destroy the planet if necessary to have more, more electricity in their gambling casino in Las Vegas. Unfortunately, those you know, those those dualist Buddhists, in that, but those are kinds of Buddhists, Buddhists like that that they're criticizing, who just want wisdom, just want their own self liberation, and they don't they feel they can't do anything about anybody else's and destroys any objectivity conviction. So then objectivity conviction is that kind of meat space thing where we attach to the rug, the floor. There's this term I always share with people because I love it so much from what are called in modern times sociologists of knowledge. It's like a certain group of people. And they have this thing. When we see something, we see it as possessing massive facticity. I love that. It's like you see a, a stone wall, you see a stone, and that stone is really there. It's the stone that really gets you. Man has massive facticity, because we have an objectivity conviction about it. But here, all objectivity convictions are weakened or destroyed or eroded when you really see the inexorable causality of everything. And they, even there, that would be an objectivity, objectivity conviction about your being in a state apart from everything, free of suffering, for yourself. That we would have, that would not be something that would be intrinsically objective. It would be something notional, perhaps, that would be inspiring for someone who is in pain and agony, just like an anesthetic is inspiring when you break something. But you don't have an objectivity conviction about it. I think that's a successful term. Anyway, okay. Appearance inevitably relative. Or nowadays I think I might prefer to translate as no, no, okay, leave it. appearance inevitably relative and voidness free from all assertions. So when one is dualistically trying to come up with an inference about relativity, about all things being empty of any non-relational core essence that makes them what they are. So then there are no assertions uh, about them. The, the, and, the, and everything that appears is inevitably relative, even if it appears to have massive facticity of its own substance, substantial existence, apart from any kind of relationship. So those two things, as long as these are understood apart, the victor's intent is not yet known. The Buddha's intent is not yet known. So this means when you have, and here... You know, I could kind of share, I had a little tiny taste of this. When you have an experience of sort of disappearing, that seems like a visceral, powerful thing. You're like, you really disappear. You're really not there any longer. You don't, like, there's no, you don't recognize a voice that's saying, oh, hey, Bob, how, what's, what's happening? What happened to you? Or something. You don't recognize that. If you had a taste of that, and then, and then you would feel you're in a space that's really the real thing because it's just a different from every other thing you have experienced as your real self experiencing really other things. So you and the other things and that duality disappears and you just you have a spaced out experience. And when you do, you tend to think that that fits what I thought the absolute should be. Something apart. Wow, I really felt it. And then you come back into the relation and then it's sort of problematic. And there are different ways of interpreting what happened. You don't even, when you do it, you don't even think you might come back. You don't care. You don't think you might. It's like those people in the near-death thing who are not really looking to be reborn. It's a really boring person like Jesus or so. Jesus' lawyer tells them, 
you've got to go back. It's not your time, you know, like, you have to go do this and that, you know, and then they go back into their broken by an auto accident body. You know, some of the near-death people have that kind of thing. So, so, so then there, it's this duality thing. Well, there's now, you know, I, when I'm back, I realize everything here is all interrelated because I've sort of isolated the big there of the absolute as elsewhere. So as long as I think those two are different, they're separate. And then what happens is you, when they call that, they call when you return to relational thing, which you didn't necessarily expect to do, and that's where there's a certain courage involved in letting go. But then when you come back, then they call that the dream-like aftermath. Samadhi, actually. It's also a samadhi, they say, once you have samadhi. And you have the space-like equipoise samadhi, and then the dream-like aftermath samadhi. And then when you have that dream-like aftermath samadhi, as you get back to you, back in meat space, in other words, then you get more and more into your old habit of attributing massive facticity to everything. It gets restored. And then you realize, oh, no, I'm getting carried away now on my old intrinsic reality habit and intrinsic identity habit, and I better go meditate, and then you meditate, and then you rehearse this disappearing thing again, and then you sort of oscillate back and forth, and there is a way of doing the path where then this oscillation is supposed to kind of get smaller and smaller to where then they can begin to get where it's like a mirror image, and the surface of the mirror is the space, the empty space, and the dreamlike illusory appearances and differentiations and relativities are, are that space, the same, on, the same, on the surface of it. And you, you're kind of aware of them two together. That's, that's sort of the way you say. But, but there is a certain type of person who doesn't need to do that kind of oscillation too much. And it's much more rapid for them not to, because then if they earlier than, if they, if they more quickly recognize that although it's illusion-like and dream-like, the post-space-like equipoise samadhi experience world, then they mature their compassion more rapidly because they have a degree of their absolute concern, you could say. Their sense of absolute drive, their intensity of that, is now connected to these illusory appearances and illusory things. So then the quality of them becomes all important to them. There's a wonderful verse that I love to cite in the, in the Samadhi Raja Sutra. King of Samadhi Sutta, which says, who understands, who truly understands causality, when they could have said relativity, but it didn't happen to say causality, soon understands emptiness. And whoever understands emptiness becomes mindful of the most insignificant things. So instead of whoever understands emptiness, takes off, launches, and goes to Mars with Elon and Jeff. <laughs> and, and Richard Branson, you know, they're all desperately running away trying to go to their, their notion of near recalpa. For, near recalpa for billionaires. And they think it's going to be on Mars. Oh. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, why it becomes, because, because the absolute becomes whether every relative thing is a little better or a little worse. Because a little better in a flow of causality is, has infinite consequence. And a little worse has infinite consequence. Now, since reality is beginningless, just because there are cycles of local universes, there's no limit to it. And infinity, that means there's no one universe. There are many. And so there's always life everywhere. And because of that, infinite numbers of people have already become fully enlightened, already have this non-dual thing, and they, and, and they are operating with infinite concern for all beings. No one of them is in control of everything, but they're, they're totally worried about everything, let's say. And so there's where we begin to get a cosmological sense which we have to let go of. We shouldn't have an objectivity conviction about it, but on a, on a relational way, we can feel a little better. We can smile about the idea of, you know, the nirvanic substance of the samsara. Sub, in the sense of substance, you know, standing under it. Or in the sense of actually being the weave of it. You follow me? So 
It's the goodwill of those beings. And then I have a formula that I used to jokingly say I was going to patent, which I failed to do, but nobody wants it anyway. But my formula is, because people, when they get into emptiness, they really get into like, yeah, but, well, what makes it compassion? Why is it good? You know? Who cares about it? I mean, it all disappears. You know, you have to let go. So what's, who says that makes it good? Wisdom. You know, because they think of like this inanimate nothing, they always their mind goes to inanimate nothingness, because that's what our culture tells us is underlying everything. And we've grown up with that, actually. And uh, it's a consensus, it's a, it's a collective vibe, you know, it's morphic resonance with all the people that we all have. And um, So, so, but when they, okay, let's just well, go. Formula, what? what? The formula. We oh, the formula, form yeah. <laughs> so, the bad guys, the bad guys are wrapped around their sense of absolute separate self. And therefore, they're very un much unhappier and frustrated. And to, but they think by dominating others or, you know, they have all kinds of things they think are methods to get less frustrated and less pissed off and less irritated and less, less anxious and, you know, hyper. And then they, whatever, th those things that they do are the wrong things to do, so they get more static back from uh, aggressing against the world. And then they become demons, and then they get into sadism and torture and weird, crazy demon things. But they, and there's an infinite number of them, because the world's beginning was in their infinite beings. That was, so it could be really bad. But there's also an infinite number of good guys, girls. Too, especially back in Ijala, the network of decades. And they are drawing their energy from everybody else's needs. The bad guys are drawing their energy from their own sense of their absolute need, only one. So, infinity times one is less than infinity to the infinite power. Because the ones who are motivated by everybody else's energy and need are so much more powerful toe-to-toe -to -toe with the bad one who's just out for themselves. Because even if they even if they're big and fat and you know have like weird hairdos and whatever, they're, they're like pathetic sad creatures. Okay? So that's my point. In case people get like worried that we're all gonna be doomed by all the infinite numbers. There are lots of demons. And uh, you know, people know that. Look at those motorcycle gangs. They paint demons on their thing, you know. <laughs> on their jackets, you know. I have some great demon shirts. Okay, when they, t-shirts. When they coincide, but here's what to do. When they coincide, not alternating. Mere sight of inevitable relativity secures knowledge beyond objectivism. An investigation of the realistic worldview is perfected. And this is really, now the, the most intelligent being, what they call the jewel-like student or practitioner or bodhisattva, is the one who gets that. And who, who, uh, who therefore sort of gets an inference where they realize the mirror nature, the mirror surface nature of even their sense of meat space. So, the mere sight of inevitable relativity means that even I see something as if it had massive facticity, and I think, oh, that's objectively over there. I'm having that kind of same experience, even though I had a, like a slippage in some meditation once, you know, and I disappeared, and that was actually kind of groovy, but, and then I didn't even know if I was coming back, but I did, and then once I came back, I started being habitual again, and then I got really into that. But then when I feel I really am habitual, I felt that I'm a bitch. So by feeling it, it's relational. If you had a self that was not relational, you it wouldn't be irrelevant to you. It would drop out, as the, as they say, you know, because you if it couldn't relate, so you couldn't experience being it. You could not. It would not be the agent of your knowing, because everything you know it changes with what you know. Right? Subject object interaction. So if it has no object, if it has no subject, it's no object, it's meaningless to say it's a subject. Okay? It has no meaning. That's all, it's really not rocket science. 
So the one who understands that, you see, then they they equip themselves with what is called the royal reason of relativity. And it's a royal, because it's, it's the royal medicine of relativity. It's the royal balm of emptiness. That's why Narkatruna says, emptiness is a medicine, a balm that heals all suffering. Except a person who takes that medicine as a, and it attaches their, their objectivity conviction to emptiness. And thinks emptiness is the real thing. And then it becomes a poison. And then there's no cure for it because they, they're stuck on what would be their medicine. Do you follow? They say that. Now Roger says that. So, they, so then they, they'd say, like, but anyway, the one who understands that secures knowledge beyond objectivisms and investigation of the view is perfected. And here's where I say that the feminine mind has a better approximation of, of, of enlightenment than the masculine one. Because the feminine mind, which is a body mind, all minds are ultimately really body minds. Like you are in a dream. You have that body in a dream that sees things and hears things. So the body is just the five senses and the sixth sense of organizing mental sense inside the five senses, in the center of the nervous system of the five senses. And so, the body mind of the female is more naturally alert to interconnection than the male. And enlightenment has been all falsely defined by the, by the Western Brahmins, a bunch of chauvinist dorks, as, as some state of separation. And some Indian dorks have come over from their high caste, you know, having lost track of this, although it's, that sweetness is totally in their culture. But still, to some of them, you know, they get a little like stiff, you know, stiff shirt. What do you call it? Like stuffed shirt, stiff shirt, stuffed dhoti. <laughs> and they come over, and then they all have a glorious, like, uh, you know, male dis disconnect of time. <laughs> holy, holy, holy. <laughs> right? And their wives and other people are out there, like, trying to prepare the, prepare the food and so on. And hoping that they won't become too, too holy to help carry out the garbage where it's heavy. So, so, so that's the thing, the relativity thing. So the royal reason, but the royal reason of relativity. This is what is fascinating about Vikalpa. Vikalpa is necessary for inference. And the royal reason of relativity means that all things are empty of any separate intrinsicity or essence, because they are made of causes of their parts and pieces, and you know, and when you keep taking apart, it, it, no core, it disappears. It's which only the quantum people found out, really. Only, you know, and okay, and if I only found out, we're on the side track in that. Okay? So, the female is, has, a, a, but if you redefine enlightenment as this greater interconnectedness, and Buddhahood is the being that is infinitely interconnected, in a loving manner with all existence, then the female is way ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> but when they coincide, so therefore this reason, if you do it, can save a lot of oscillating, that's what I'm saying. If you get the roots, you get the reason. And also, it, it, it's a considered protection against the seduction of separation. Like my original guru, Danji, bless his heart, Danji Leden Sanimete, he made me so pissed off when I was first studying with him. Because I was, it was like the Dharma was exploding in golden letters of Tibetan and Sanskrit in my mind. And he was reading these texts to me, so I was learning his language. And then I wanted to run away and meditate. And then every time I was meditating, I would very quickly get, like, sort of head toward the outer body. Certainly, as a highly anxious, like, 20-year-old, 21-year-old, you know, a fakir, a sadhu, you know. And he would show up, pound on the door of my little cubicle or wherever, find me out in the bush when I started running away and get behind the tree if I wanted to, like, <laughs> go there, you know. He would show up, like, what are you doing? Oh, 
Meditating, oh, that's a waste of time. You're not ready for that. You don't want to learn. And you, whatever it was, come have some yogurt. Get out in the audience. It's like, I thought it was just part of this thing about he didn't want to be, me to be a monk. He was just totally, totally against me being a monk. And he said, oh, I know you want to be a monk. I know you want to meditate. You shouldn't be, because you won't be later. And it's embarrassing in our tradition. You can't quit. Even though lamas are, because taking the excuse of the exile, you know, and the invasion, which is a good excuse. But, but um, I was so bummed. But he saved me. I think I could have gone and I could have gotten stuck somewhere. And then what happens? Your mind really slows down, and you're wanting to really care about every little thing. It's like, well, what? Who cares? You know? It's like I can leave. I can take off any time. And then that's then then you lose compassion. Then, although it seems you're cool, you then actually, your larger evolution toward a, toward a really enlightened state slows way down. Mm. They say. So, so that's the Messian view is perfect. But then it's a beautiful, and, and then actually in Tantra, uh, the great Tibetan masters, this is something that I haven't found in any Indian source text, but there must be the great Indian Tantric masters were amazing also, and wrote so many books, too, but in Tibetan ones, that, that uh, this ability to hold a paradox in the mind, like the relativity, even the relativity even of the experience of an absolute, even if the feeling of my experience the absolute, but by holding in the mind that in for the inference, then there is a kind of a defense of being seduced by, into the, by the seeming absoluteness of the experience. Because I'm experiencing it, it's relative. That becomes like second nature. That's where then the, the mirror surface and the coinciding of your somatic state, imagined as a separation, and your, inter and your yoga, and your downward dog, your upward dog, your whatever it is, and then, then later then the, the different body that you start having with chakras and things. If you want to go in that direction, go to that extent with it. And, and all of that has to be emptiness to work. And, to, and you have to be aware of the emptiness of your actual meat space body in order to really develop the power of imagination, of, which is vikalpa. Kalpa means to build something. Of kulp means, the verb root kulp means to build. And so, and vikalpa means to build discerningly. Vi means you know, dividing it. And uh, so you have to build yourself a new body. That's like Mids and Buddha or Vajrasattva or Shiva or Shakti or whatever it is. And you, can't, you won't really realistically be able to do that until you realize that you're building your body now, as it is. But now it seems to go automatic. And this is the big difference in Buddhist psychological science to Western one, which thank goodness the Westerners finally got one with Mr. Freud and company. But, um, and that the, the Westerners think that the subconscious is automatically necessarily there. It's like the main part of the body of the iceberg and the conscious mind is just the tip and all of this. And that does describe accurately from the Buddhist po scientific point of view for thousands of years what the unenlightened person is like, driven by this huge seething bunch of impulses. But therefore the goal of the practitioner, and it is the same in India too, all of the Indic traditions, Jainism, so Vaishnavism, Shaivism, better better than say Shaktism, better than say Hinduism, which is just basically all of them. They all into that, and so they're all into creating a better reality, another reality. But and with all, the, then there are many who who divert and get seduced by some sort of absolute experience that then makes the world unimportant. And then, then the world doesn't change. But India was not, that was, a, that was not the, that was the exception rather than the rule in India. The proof being the vulnerability of the country. A, a nation, a bunch of nations that had defeated Alexander the Great, the unconquerable Macedonian phalanx of all pumped up with Iranian soldiers and Africans and Egyptians and whoever it was, uh, defeated them. Uh, but a thousand years later, or you know, thirteen hundred years later, they were trampled by a bunch of weirdos on camels. Mm -hmm. Not nearly as forceful as Alexander, probably. And because of that proves that they really understood this, that, that, that the rule was that they weren't so seduced by that in either any form of Hinduism or or, or Jainism or Buddhism. 
because they were more gentle, they were more connected, they were, they were choosing to live interrelatedly and more happily, knowing their vulnerability, actually. And with the tremendous wealth that they had, they naturally attracted people wanting to conquer them, and the latest bunch being the Brits, or well, the Portuguese Dutch Brits. Okay? So then, that only, then the only place left was Tibet for a while. And then the Tibetans and little pockets out everywhere. I mean, you know. And then the Tibetans went and they did this poor things to the Mongolians, who used to be pretty rough. And they became vulnerable in this last century. Anyway. Now we're all vulnerable, fortunately. Nobody can conquer anybody. People can think they do, but they can destroy, but no one can conquer. I really think that's arguable. Okay, but then this is a wonderful thing, and the last verse is really wonderful. This is what I call, I have a mudra for this verse, which is if you do the finger in the church and the steeple, you know, part where you interlock your fingers. I bet there's a yogic thing, David, who will tell us, where you turn your hands backward and put the backs of your hands together, but keep the fingertips interlocking. And, and so then if you try to pull apart, they get more tightly together, right? Or like Chinese finger puzzle, you know, where you, once you're in it, when you pull out, it gets more tight, right? So that's the mudra of this, last, this verse, I think. It says, more, it says, as experience dispels absolutism, and voidness clears away nihilism, you know voidness dawn as cause and effect, then you will never be deprived by extremist views. So this is sort of locking you into the realistic worldview, in other words. By shifting, you see, why? First, you might not just like to comment. In other words, when you do the oscillating, you know, your focus on voidness, your one-pointed samadhi on voidness, clears away any absolutism. Because anything that you look at as if it were absolute, when you reach it, by reaching it, it's void, your voidness pursued uh, melted down. And you realize it's relativity, because you just we reached there, I would say. You didn't find something objectively resisting you there. You know, you melted into it. In other words. So that's, so normally experience gets rid of, gets rid of nihilism. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Normally voidness gets rid of absolutism, in that sense. Of making anything into absolute. Or yourself or any other thing. And normally experience then, when you get out of that trance, and then you're back connecting to things because you see them, although you think that's because you came down from your trance, it wasn't deep enough, if you're in the oscillating pattern. And then, but then you realize, well, I'm still having this illusion, and even though it's a dream-like or illusion-like, it's not nothing. When I hit there, I thought it was all nothing I, for a time being, but when I come back then, I'm back here again. So it, it's definitely not nothing. It's not, what, it's not meat space that I thought. It's an illusory meat space, but it's still something. So that clears away nihilism. So that's when you're oscillating. In the non-oscillating, when you have the royal reason of relativity, your experience of difference, of real difference, of someone else, of something else, that means you're experiencing it, so it is an absolute. When you're feeling absolute yourself, when do you feel most absolute yourself? When you're in a towering rage. Because you'll break everything, and you'll even kill, people even kill themselves break their body. When they're, when they're, they're, so that just means that that false sense of absoluteness about something in there, but gripped by a powerful emotion, will even wreck your own relativity, your, your physical body. People will kill themselves out of fury, for sure. But not to mention others, and break things, and so on. So, and that's, that's what we should meditate on that a little bit. Yeah, we have time. Mm -hmm. So, so, so when, once you get the royal reason of relativity, though, whatever you experience cannot be absolute. Because experiencing it makes it relative. And voidness m means that there's no real nothing. So you know that voidness is relativity. So there's no nothing. So that clears away the whole thing. So this is what, this is that locks you in, you say. Can't get part. You can't get the mirror surface of the free relativity, of causality, and, uh, 
and the mirror images of all the sort of seemingly separate objects. You, they can't, you can't be, and then you are a suitable candidate for the, for the reimagining of the universe that is what Tantra is. And, the, and then realizing the re better imagined universe. Because after all, you see, if everyone is imagined, that's why governments have propaganda departments. That's why, you know, they, Roger Ailes and Rupert Murdoch destroyed Australia and our country. And they were close to England. And they pretty much England too. And they walked through the rest of the world because they became everybody's vikalpa. And with all false reality. And then people just destroyed themselves because they thought that's what they're supposed to do. They just repeated Rush Limbaugh or something, all owned by those same person, same people. Those are demons. Those are the demons. And um, somehow the good guys are too low-key. They don't have a network. <laughs> <laughs> no, I begged him to get a network, that guy. You know that story. He wouldn't do it. I mean, I'm sure he's rude the day since then. Someone who could have. Anyway, never mind. So... So then, this is the thing. So let's meditate on this now. Let's meditate on this. Okay? So that's, so that's it. Royal reason of relativity. But that, so that, that those four verses, I think you'll find really helpful to go back to again and again. I found them just so amazing. Because, you know, you see, if you take the reason why this is the foundation for your esoteric practice, the higher levels of Hatha Yoga, the higher levels of Tantra, and so on, is that if you take an unquestioned and uncriticized meat space conviction about the real substantial reality of everything in the ordinary habitual world, and then you make a visualization campaign and you sort of create like an alternative universe or something, and you transfer that objectivity conviction into the alternative universe, then you become kind of like, a, you create a psychotic reality for yourself. You know, instead of knowing that this one, when meat space invests with full objectivity conviction, actually is a psychotic reality, with me being the absolute being somehow problematically in this relative thing where it's all absolute other than me, that's all psychotic. And then that, and then and then, when you know that this one is imagined, is a is a construction. Mind is it's not just mind, but mind because there are other minds. But it's a mind field. Of and the shape is given by the minds in the field. Then you can create another kind of mind field. And then the fact that there are beings on a certain planet creating that other kind of mind field, like dear old Maharishi said does create a morphic resonance vibration that in a way subliminally liberates other beings. So actually when you shift your mind, when you really decide, I understand the royal reason of relativity, that is make, that's common sense, it's not even high logic, it's logic though, and it's common sense. Things are made of pieces that they are relational. And, and the idea of them, or the the scheme of them, the, the architectural pattern of it is not the essence of it at all. And also it's made up of components. You know? So when you really know that, then, then you're regarded against absolutizing, whatever it is. I love it. Okay, now meditate. Now in this meditation, in order to understand emptiness, in order to understand selflessness, you have to understand what is the self, or what is the non-empty essence that these two negative expressions, selflessness, emptiness, you know, voidness, these are negations, negative expressions. And what is it that they are negating? You cannot understand a negation, like this room has no elephant, elephantlessness of this room, unless you know what is an elephant. Then you look for it, you don't find it, as what you thought it was, uh, it should be, it would have to be to be an elephant, and then you understand elephant process. So you begin by meditating on the self, actually rather than some notion of emptiness or selflessness. 
And by, and by meditating on the self, you cultivate a memory in your meditation. This is sort of, a, as a, not esoteric, but a rare personal instruction, which is in the Dalai Lama's tradition. And you reflect on a time, try to remember a time in your life, experience. Actually, usually it doesn't take it all to go far that back. When somebody falsely accused you of either doing something, thinking something, being something that you're not, thinking something that you're not thinking, doing something that you didn't do, so you're innocent. You strive to remember such an incident. And you try to do it kind of like a like an actor, you know, an actor's workshop or act actor's studio or something, where your memory consciousness is a lesser part of your consciousness. It's like a witness that's like looking from behind the curtain or from behind the screen or through a peephole through time. And it's not the main, where your main attention is vested. Your main attention should be vested in re-inhabiting the experience. You know, feeling the emotions that you felt. Feeling the concepts that you thought when you were innocent and some, someone, which it's good if it's someone who is some way related to you closely, could be you know, a traffic cop or something, doesn't matter. Someone falsely accusing you and you are the injured innocent. Is this is the best time, according to a Buddhist psychology, to begin to get a feeling of the self that is being negated. What's called the negandam or the negati of the expression of selflessness. And it takes time. Uh, and there are some books where lamas say, we meditate on this for six months when you're studying emptiness. But we, we you know, we're not... It's just, a, just showing that it's something important. But you try to really relive that memory. And when you, you know, one obstacle that you'll come to you when you really work on it, make that a work of a meditation, is that you will tend to veer into how you reacted at the time, where you became eventually righteously indignant, First wounded, you know, hurt feelings, and then righteously indignant because you're innocent. And then if the person persisted, angry, and angrily protesting your innocence, and becoming angry at them for having thought you would have done, and you did do, etc., and blah, blah, blah. So one tends to veer into that, where the sense of a self that is sort of absolute in its impulse to self-assert, arises. So some might think that would be the best time to see the absolutes of the self, but not really, because when you try to remember a time when you were in a towering fury, it's very hard to re-inhabit, because you can't really, you lost track of yourself in that. But the time where you were being kindled into it, falsely accused, wrongly treated, mistreated, misconceived, There you can feel that your sense of your innocence lets you sort of come out more strongly with your, that it's absolute. And the real you would not have done that, never would. And before expressing that, this is a really powerful feeling of it that you want to find in the memory. Just take time here.
they say that uh, when you succeed in this, which is known as the first key in meditating emptiness or selflessness, they stay meditating, I'm just uh, guiding, you know. They call it the first key and they say when you succeed in inhabiting that memory, that kind of memory, each person will have a different one, of course, is when you will admit to yourself that on a visceral level, you don't really agree with these people who say that there's no self, that you have no self, you do not agree. And, uh, and there are also those people who say that in the name, it's a, you know, Vedanta or Madhyamata, it doesn't matter, because people who say that you have no self in terms of your personality, character, whatever, you know, your self-image, when they say supreme self, they mean something like vast and completely not your, so they're also negating actually the personal self. But they make it sound easy because they say supreme self, rather than the scary negation of selflessness. But supreme self is a negation of, of ordinary self for sure. So they're the same on that, really. So, so anyway, since we're doing this just in short compass to learn it, you know, imagine that you feel so strongly about you, you admit to you, find in yourself a strong sense of self that was not the one who would have done such and such at the time when you were the injured innocent. Then there's called, there's a second key. And the second key is really interesting for a non-dual practice. The second key is acknowledging and making a commitment in your mind and you're for your meditation. So you're going to accept the challenge of the Buddha and the tradition of that, or even Shankara and the Vedanta tradition, of looking for your real identity of you as a separated person, which you feel. And you're going to do it. But And if you find it, that's great. You can try to reinterpret whatever they said, or you can reject what either Buddha or Shankara said. Because you'll have found that real self. Or you fail, might fail to find it, and if you fail to find it, then you might be agreeing with them, and then you have to cope with that failing to find it. But you're not going to go into any third, there's no third option. Either you will find it or you won't find it you kind of make a commitment to, a, to not seeking a third option. In other words, in a way, I, you could also call this key the, accept, the, con, the acceptance of conventionality, of binary conventionality of our conceptual mind. So it's a kind of on the plane of the royal reason of relativity that it connects with that. And then the third thing which we can do, so those two keys, let's just imagine they've gone by, and now we'll continue our meditation on the third key. And the third key is looking through the processes of your body and your mind for that real self that you feel you really, really have, real identity, self-identity that you really have. And so you start by looking in your physical processes, and since you were yogis and you may have seen a cadaver, <laughs> or you might have been in medical school, you know, or you don't have the knowledge of anatomy, you will quickly reject the idea of kind of a little homunculus, in my case, Bob, somewhere in some chakra sitting there, physically, in sort of coarse physicality. That won't work. And then, so you reject that it's in the material processes, that there's this fixed absolute thing, all the material processes you acknowledge to be relative and causal. And then you look in your sensational processes. I, I mean by that, sensory processes. And, you know, your feelings of pain, feelings of pleasure, feel your numb feeling, neutral feelings. People usually translate this as feelings, this level of process, which I don't like because that 
branches over into emotion, which is actually a different set of processes. This is really sensations, pleasure, pain, or numbness. And when you were feeling injured innocent, you note that it was like a, it was like a sensation of a, a pleasant stability of really me being you and pure of the, and unguilty and innocent of this guilt. It was kind of like a feeling of home or a feeling of solid presence or something inside yourself. Real, real, the real you and presence in your way, not some vast thing with no boundary. And uh, so that, that was a kind of sensation, but when you go back to think about that sensation, you realize it's sort of, it's, not, it's, it's, it's a relational process. So it's not, there's nothing absolute about it or its object. Then you come to your conceptions your vikalpas, your concepts. And you look through all the, you know, your name, the labels of all the different entities that constitute you and meet space and so forth and so on. And you eventually reject that there's one thing that's a real you, that, that's some name. You know? It's different people call you different things, you know, you react to that, although you're used to your name. But it's not carved in any part of your anatomy or in your neuron, you know. And you can always change your name. You know? And then you go to your emotions and deeper mental functions, like a sense of time, a sense of space. But you don't need to get so sophisticated. You basically go to emotions. And you know, yeah, you get a big emotion out of I'm mad or I'm desiring or I'm obsessed or I'm confused or I'm depressed. You get into like big emotions or I'm giddy with joy or something. But they're all constantly changing. They rise and they disappear, come and they go. And any one of them is you, you also reject. And then you come to your consciousness. And then you, that's where you then would naturally feel that the real you is. It's the most subtle of the five sets of processes, which is only a schematization. It's not anything absolute about it. But anyway, you get to consciousness, and then you, you start looking back into your own consciousness to find the real you that is almost a looker, let's say. And you quickly take your consciousness apart a little bit, because you realize that a lot of your consciousness is reacting to visual impressions and having internal visual images visualizing images, hearing sounds, and having internal visual, you know, audializing sounds, and tastes, touches, and smells, you know, but a lot of your consciousness, so there are five different sets of consciousness, and then there's a sixth consciousness that goes and kind of tries to organize and interpret all of that, drawing from concepts, and generating sensations, and generating emotions. So it's very busy, multiplex kind of situation in your consciousness you will come to see. But you will then, eventually, if you keep doing that, you will get to like, you keep turning back into it and deeper and deeper and more and more subtle and you come to like, what is like a, the core witness, what you feel is like a core witness. And then you, then the royal reason of relativity helps you a lot because you, you know, it seems very, very core, but then you kind of probe back into it. And then when you probe back into it, you sort of do a turning inside your mind, probing back into the mind that thinks it's doing it. And then it seems to keep slipping out of your view, your internal mental view. Because, and then, but then you will, of course, it did because I'm the one who's best, it's now looking. And, you, and yes, uh, if it was looking one way and then looked another way inside the mind, then it changes its direction, it changes its object. But you're still feeling that there's something that's not changing that really still has your identity stamped on it, is there and deeper in. You keep turning and twisting to find that. And then you're doing something that can be, you're doing something that they give a metaphor for, simile for in Tibetan, in Buddhist, in Indian Buddhist literature, they call it the diamond drill. 
diamond cutting drill, which has to be another diamond, you know, an unbreakable drill point, drill bit, which itself has to be diamond, to cut a diamond. And this turning, it's a very, this is the most difficult, this is the one difficult thing, to get one pointed on this turning, looking for your real witness self, and then being the witness self is doing the looking, and then looking for yourself, looking, and then looking for yourself, looking, and then looking for yourself, looking, and looking for yourself, looking. And, yourself, looking. and being a diamond drill about it. And, and then, if you can stand it, if you have enough one-pointed concentration, samadhi power to not veer off, it's like your samadhi is like a, a drill press that holds the whirling bit of your awareness against its object, which is the whirling bit of its awareness. So two diamonds are point to point, being held not to deviate off the point, drilling into each other in your mind, something like that. And then, it's unbearable actually, it's such a tension, and an inner mental tension and stress. It's yet unbearable. It's like a mountain on top of your head, it's like a mountain inside your heart. Like, it becomes like a diamond fire, it becomes like lightning, like electricity. And actually then the whole thing melts and it creates light and heat. Like when you drill something hard, that the bit and the thing that's being drilled are equally hard and it gets red hot and then melts. Especially if it's any metal. And imagine, imagine that even diamond does. And, and then you, you will go for maybe just for relief and you can veer off at a more you know less deep plane you will only go as deep as you are aware of your sense of conviction about your real self if you're not that aware if you haven't done the initial first key where you become aware of how deep you feel about your real self then you you won't go to that you only go as deep as whatever you feel you you felt it and then you'll go into a space like equipoise samadhi and there are, then there are degrees of that and degrees of that. And then when you go into space like Ekopoi Samadhi, your momentum of probing, your momentum of one-pointed critical inspection, you might say, sort of swirls all around. It's like the drill got all crazy and it's like slashing around in all directions within this vast space. And it, and, but, and, and it itself seems to dissolve into the vast, it's lost in the vast space. And it, as I said, that it's not, one time is not Buddha depth. One time is only as deep as the sense of the self has been acknowledged, has been miserably acknowledged, has been experienced, sense of the fixed self. But it's whatever degree it is, it's a blissful, thing because of the relief of getting away from the stress of looking critically for the self. And people can stay for days in that kind of a trance for some time. And, and it, it is, it can be, you know, then, then when they emerge, which they say inevitably do, since it's still a relative experience, although it doesn't feel relative, because it so much fits with what one imagines the absolute to be in a dualistic way but an absence of anything relative. And the sort of implication that one entered it through a boundary in time and space and therefore it is still relative and one exits it at a boundary in time and space and into the illusion like aftermath samadhi. These kind of unfold by implication but having going into that with the knowledge of the royal reason of relativity very, very important not to misinterpret it in a self-imprisoning manner and get locked into some unexamined concept of a nothingness or a vastness or something. Ding! What oh, happened?
Your mic was picking up on it. Oh. So, <laughs> okay. So, uh, you say when you really realize emptiness, when you get close to getting deep in this royal reason of relativity, that you'll have like a sensation up the back of your neck, like when you feel a thrill, you know, with the hair, the, the fine hairs will rise on the back of your neck. That means you have a good effort. Oh, you might feel even a little frightened. And either one of those is, is, a, is supposedly a sign of a good affinity. With, and if you stay cool, you're either like way past it or you're hopeless. Would that be like the nervous system? What's that? The nervous system releasing or? What's that? The, the, Please wait for the microphones. Hair. You have to see it. What? Oh, thank you. Um, my question is that the, the sensation of the hair rising on the back of the neck, would that be like related maybe? Yeah, that's a prana. Thing? It's a prana thing because oh, understanding is a prana thing. Okay. Actually, I would say from tantric abhidharma level, that if you, in order to fully understand what they call the middle way, I prefer to call it centrism or the central way, you can only be understood with having opened the central channel, yogically. So the complete conceptual, the deep conceptual, non-dual conceptual experiential understanding of that is simultaneously with the opening of the central channel. And in the Buddhist thing, the central channel uh, which 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 uh, we can start working about tomorrow from this side of it is you're working about all the time in your yoga practice. But the central channel has at each chakra level above and below it is knotted off by the right and left channels, and then at the heart level it's the threefold knot above and below. It's a sixfold knot, which actually is this is the real meaning of the two triangles, you know, the Shiva Shakti two triangles or the Seal of Solomon. <laughs> which was probably the seal of Shiva, see, who brought it to him, no doubt. But uh, that's actually what that, that, that six-point triangle is actually relates to, that, that six-point knot at the heart chakra. Uh, although that's a great knot, though. Don't, don't knock the six-fold knot, even if uh, one is in mid space, because the six-fold knot happens at conception and, and, at, and at birth and then growing. And it holds one's consciousness in, in, in its deepest, most subtle level of consciousness, the core consciousness. It holds it uh, in animative relationship to the force body. And the more subtle, the, and the, it's the super subtle level of consciousness, the subtle consciousness and the coarse consciousness in the Buddhist way, which are just heuristic, you know, to have only three levels. Are, uh, are, that's the anchor of it. So opening it is a little tricky because it normally opens for everyone when they die. It, and, and, but, and then since they don't know how to handle uh, the, the layers of the subtle that, that want to push and pull around the thing, then it sort of shoots in a direction they don't know where it's going to go. They don't control its evolutionary trajectory. Okay? Any question, any question anyone has arising from experimentally doing that beginning meditation. Did anyone succeed in remembering how pissed off you were? I'm so, I'm so cute. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I think, you know, pop psychology gets there. You know, there's a book that I never got a copy of and I, I never had time. I'm going to find it someday. It's called Who Moved My Cheese? And it has a sequel. Like, who else moved it? And it goes on and on. And I think it must be something dealing with that kind of reactivity. You know? Must be. And they're t talking about, you know, did you, did you eat my camembert? <laughs> yeah, you ate it. I know you did. So what else? No, I didn't. No question about that? Did anybody remember some such incident? Did you feel how, I mean, we can all experimentally go, you know, your yoga teacher could like whack you on the back of the leg. To say, you know, doing downward dog right, and you're like, oh, it didn't hit me, you know? Or we could step on each other's toes, and then we would immediately feel. <laughs> but it would be so quick. But, you know, did you, you have to find it in memory and relive it. And that's where the root reactivity comes from, of course. And it's not a good thing. Do you have a question? <laughs> Very good. Uh, um, so, is that similar to. 
Oh, Rob, what's your name again? Oh, Robin. Robin. Okay, but the why? I. I. Okay, Robin. Okay, Robin. But you met me before as Rama. I'm sorry. You met me before as Rama. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> I was also your mom. <laughs> and vice versa. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, how is this um, what we did different than Ramana Maharshi's um, questioning? Who am I? It's not different at all. Right. It's the same. Okay. That's what I said. I said that the one who does it seemingly so different. Because they say that, oh, you're looking for Parama Atma. You're looking for what you really are as a supreme self. So they're making you feel safe in a sense. But you keep finding layers of what you thought was self and not finding them. And so, and, the, and from a Buddhist psychological point of view, not religious, but psychological point, they would consider that a little less skillful psychologically, except in certain cases. But Buddha sometimes does that too. Like, you know, your real self, they talk about Buddha nature, you know. You have a real self. They also do that. But for someone who would become too nihilistic too quickly, you know, under the selflessness thing. So, but for most people, their sense of self is so much on the surface and they're so into themselves that they need kind of that selflessness is better and it helps avoid the misinterpretation should they have an experience of total isolation, total uh, contemplative isolation, and then think of that as like something that's, that's really what it all is. Right. So that would be considered a little less skillful psychologically for them, but for a majority of self-obsessed narcissistic people. <laughs> okay. Was that the whole question? Do you have more questions? Robin, I'm, kind of, I'm just making myself remember it. Yeah. Do you have enough more? There's well, one behind. Well, when you do. Oh when, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, when you do the. Who am I? You can also have the experience that I am you. And when you, when you do what? You can have the experience of being everybody, uh -huh. like the, the same self. Like, who am I? And I and I realize that I am actually you. There's only one thing, and it's all right. the same. Right. That's a confusing thing that happens, apparently. <laughs> but before it happens. The failure to find the separated self that we are living as in meat space tends to make everything, everyone else and oneself to reach a oneness through all of us disappearing. Because when you see yourself as disappearing, everyone else seems to disappear also. They always, they always say that something Aryadeva, the great Aryadeva, Arjuna's great disciple Aryadeva, he says, however you think of yourself, or how you experience yourself is how you project all everyone else is. So when you discover your own emptiness, then you are aware of everyone else's emptiness. And as I said, there's this thing in the first discovery of the emptiness where it seems like something disappears. But technically nothing has disappeared because the sense of being an absolute separated self was a false one. But there is no it disappears through finding it's not there. So actually nothing has been destroyed. There's no ego destruction. Ego is simply put in its place with its priority as a pronoun, as a as a bunch of syllables in Indian aham, a handy sort of thing. Aham. Aham. And then, then they, oh yeah, that's God's self, must be, because everybody disappeared into that, including God. So therefore, it's as good as being God. And then the level of where you come back and you stay at being everybody else. Then, then if you did that, you're going to really want them to like, you know, only be worthy of cleaning your shit and then you couldn't even like sit in a room with them or if their shadow fell on you, you have to go and have a bath. You would sort of, that would melt that down. That kind of barriers would not at least be, have the sort of phobic quality that they tend to have in some holy places where there's some purity and impurity and ooh, ah, and, and soul and body and ooh, body's all impure, you know. Ladies all covered up in bags, you know. <laughs> Guys all very white, I mean, they're big comb overs. <laughs> so, so okay. And then you had a question. The lady just behind you. Maybe I'm back here first. Oh, oh no, she. Oh. No, she's been waiting. Oh, where are you going? Okay, all right. Yeah, good. Find the person. Can't see her in the shadows. Yes, yes. What? So if we're 
Um, oh, you're the lady with the cute dog. <laughs> okay, what's your name? Sandy. Sandy? Yes. What's the dog's name? Fiesta. What? Fiesta. Fiesta. Fiesta? Oh, that's... <laughs> I thought you said Shivaratra. <laughs> okay, Fiesta, that's safer. Yes. Okay. So, I, I appreciate... First of all, thank you so much for this occasion. It's so like amazing to be studying with you all, and um, thank you. And uh, thinking about beings and being interrelated with all beings and no self, emptiness of self, so all is relational. How do we then reckon with how we qualify, you know, the different substrata of beings? Like, for example, Clearly, we value human beings, right, more than, well, how many do people. We, how, so, I'm getting to the question. Sorry, to you're so talking clear. to a three-year-old, semi-two-year-old. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, how do we reckon? How do with, we reckon with the conventional way by which we qualify the value of the different beings, like worms? What value is their life? What dogs? Why what value? You know, in, how, in terms of how we relate with them, if all is relational, how do we understand the value of that worm in front of me, or that... Oh, the worm. Worm. M sorry. <laughs> a worm? No, like a worm. worm. What is the well, value you, of a worm's you, you life? You understand the value of the worm. Uh, you, first of all, if you became, I mean, you became fully enlightened, you would feel you were the worm, and therefore you would feel definitely concur with the worm's sense of its value. You would. But short of that, you can get, you can like learn karmic biology, which karma is a biological theory, as I tirelessly, or actually somewhat tirelessly, repeat. And, uh, and so then the worm has biologically has evolved to that form and has that kind of senses and experiences, etc. You know, you can understand it that way also. But, but and you can also empathize and feel what the worm feels. You can do both of those. And that gives the worm a certain value. It doesn't give the worm in a way, even for the worm's own self, it doesn't give relative self. It, the worm doesn't have, the worm body is not as valuable as when the worm was human. Or and when the worm will quickly, as you hope, to be human again, when it could not overshoot human and become some kind of worm-like Brahma body god, like worming around in golden light and endless <laughs> gurgling around, and still not really getting to where they connect to everything. So you know how to help the worm. Then, but but all these well-meaning enlightened beings are apparently helping the worm. Apparently. But, you know, some beings have really got themselves convinced of being a worm to stay worming for quite a while and get into it. I mean, imagine yourself. I mean, the worm is a little complicated, but imagine you are, a, you know, a lion or something and you died, you know, and you died as a lion got to be old, mangy lion, you died. Then in the bardo, you're seeing different kinds of beings, and some human beings are making love. They look so weird. They just look like food, sort of writhing around. And then you see another lion, a lioness. Oh, a male lion and the lioness, like, getting it on. And you think, oh, that, that's a wonderful body. And that was what I'm used to. I'm going to be like that. And bam, you're a cub. <laughs> It's not obvious, in other words, that it's a step up to be a human. <laughs> well, just we wouldn't because. necessarily gravitate toward being a human. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, it, it, that's sort of the simplistic way of thinking about it. But, um, so the, the worm has as same value you do, same value as Buddha does. Worm has Buddha nature, but the form the worm has is not as valuable at all as, a for, as forms that are evolutionarily closer to Buddhahood. And of all of those, the human is considered the most valuable. <coughs> for the reasons I said, although there are many demons and gods who are smarter than humans, actually. But they, they're, they're distracted more. It's like within humanity, some very high humans tend to waste their life form just holding on to their highness. It happens, you know. They, they, like, that's why Dalai Lama always likes to say, he was liberated by Mao. 
And he doesn't mean like that when some silly people think that they're also happy that Tibet has suffered genocide, is still suffering, kind of genocide, ethnocide at least for sure. And uh, it doesn't, he doesn't mean that, but what he means is that when he had to live within the structure, social structure of a, of a, of a lama in a gilded cage, he wouldn't have had certain kinds of suffering. He wouldn't have had, you know, he wouldn't have met all different kinds of people and things. He wouldn't have been dealing with the broader reality personally. Although by being an enlightened being, he would have been aware of it, actually. I, I don't say that Tibetans were, were isolated in this, they weren't really aware of the world. I think the highly enlightened ones were highly aware. And they were very concerned about the way the planet was. You know. The enlightened beings are, because that is what enlightened beings are. They're concerned. Avalokiteshvara, that name, Kuan Yin, you know, the Chinese, Avalokiteshvara means the God who looks with concern. Avalokita means he looks, looks, looks on with concern. Wants to take care of everything and everyone. Thousand arms are what happens if you get so concerned. <laughs> you want to like reach into every bag of misery with the many arms. You know. That's what it means. That's what that symbol means. So... But, but he was liberated to go and really see it firsthand, interact firsthand. He's become this global figure. Which uh, Dalai Lama's before were not acknowledged as being. Which is kind of cool. But uh, the, the politics has kept him from reaching out to some of the people who like him most, which are Chinese people. The billion of them, more than billion. They tend to really like him a lot. Kuan Yin, they're Kuan Yin, they like. Another question, was there another question? Yeah, you had that. Yeah, I saw you. Do you still have it? Yeah. Thank you, Sandy. And Fiesta. <laughs> Sandy with Fiesta, yes. Um, so my question is, about, back to emptiness. Back to question is? About wisdom in the context of emptiness. Wisdom in the context of emptiness, okay. Yes? Can you speak to that? Can I speak to that? Well, I did speak to that. That's what it's all about. <laughs> In other words, the knowledge of emptiness is wisdom. That's it. Prajna, you know, yeah, pra, the, the, the Sanskrit word is prajna. And the jna is the knowing that we were joking about last night. The knowing, same in Greek, because the languages are cognate, they're interconnected. And uh, pra means super. So prajna means super knowing. And in a way, I think by super knowing, what that means is, you know, when you super know something, you kind of become what you know. You are your, it's part of you. And you, the boundary, the barrier, subject-object barrier between you breaks down. And you kind of, you, know, you can know lots of facts and things about it, but somehow you just really know it. By being it, that's super knowing. So... What, 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 what wisdom, transcendent wisdom is, I mean, there's, so there's, there are degrees and degrees of wisdom, of course. But transcendent wisdom, then, is knowledge that has transcended the subject-object boundary of reality. Okay? Emptiness is reality. And the fact that reality is not something apart from this relational reality makes it, therefore, that relativity is reality even though it's illusory. The fact that they say it's illusory simply means uh, that it's illusory while causally in webbed means simply that there are magical levels of causality. It's not just like one level of causality. And therefore materialism is not an accurate philosophy or not a complete philosophy. Let's say it may be accurate on its level, but not complete. And uh, so, so wisdom, the wisdom concept in this tradition, is doing something that is very rare on the planet, and including even in, in, in religious India. And that is, it is urging people to, to ameliorate themselves, to, to fix themselves out of suffering as much as possible, by knowledge, and, and with encouragement that they can understand their situation thoroughly. They can become realistic completely. They can avoid delusion completely, see through it. That's kind of, you know, it's like pick your delusion, it's more like what you normally hear. You know, when I was a child, when I was a young person getting quote-unquote educated, 
That's what I was told. I was told that God knows and you don't, so you just believe what we tell you. And I said, no, I'm very sorry, I don't get it. And I won't agree with that, and that's not correct. And uh, I don't even like God, he's too grumpy. <laughs> and then on the other side, we go to the sciences, oh yeah, oh, we're discovering great stuff. But the more we discover, the more we don't know. They get all, they all read Socrates, you know, in their youth, their education. And then Socrates goes around, oh, I know nothing. Oh, but the Devil Oracle says I'm the wisest person in Greece, but I know nothing. So they think that's supposed to be smart, that you know nothing. Actually, we hear a number of Buddhists going on about, ah, Guruji has reached the stage of knowing nothing. Isn't that great? Wait a minute. That's where we started. <laughs> for doing the ignoramuses. No. Knowing everything is more like That's what enlightenment is. And so you can do that. Is and not only really can you do that, I'm sorry, I'm still on your other question. Yeah, yeah. Not only can you do that, but you have to do that to fix your world. That's what you ultimately, you have to do that. Others are trying to fix things, hanging together, etc. And, and even without fully knowing what you're doing, you, every time you do something good, you know, you're being Buddha, you know? You know, you're being Buddha is as Buddha does, you know? But without necessarily knowing why, but fully, fully. But we all know why when we do something that hurts somebody, we do something when it helps them. But then sometimes, it's like tricky. Sometimes people, you know, like who are addicted, they need a little roughness, for example, etc. Okay, I'm sorry, now next question. So, com it's a sub-question. So, compassion is part of that wisdom? Compassion, that wisdom becomes compassion. Since compassion is the consideration of others' suffering to be as unbearable as one's own suffering, one naturally considers that one's own suffering to be unbearable, compassion means that you feel that other suffering is just as unbearable. And once you, once you have, you and the other have disappeared both into the cheap unity, then you more and more get used to the expensive unity where you're still here while disappearing. <laughs> So you were very changeable, though, luckily. That's why it's expensive. Then you have to really deal with it all. And then, you've been there, you know, you're, you're, there's nothing privileged. Like when I heard, when you heard it say, become same to you. And that's when, you're, when you are like a mom, you're like that. When that baby hurts you, you're just hurting. And when you're a lover, you, when your beloved hurts, you hurt. And we have that capability. Right? People will, will die for the other because it's unbearable to them that they are suffering. And then they'll put themselves into suffering to prevent them, what they think, from suffering. Right? Of course, the ideal is nobody dies, everybody has a good time. That's the ideal. But uh, and they, that's what we are supposed to be able to do, according to these people. That's why India, you know, India had its Masters and Johnson 2,000 years ago. Okay? They had the name of life of pleasure was something they had. That was not necessarily a normal one, was still ego driven, was not that great, but it was still something. And they had the tremendous wealth, and they had these great ragas. Who has a raga like that? Like Ravi Shankar. <laughs> they have 2,000 varieties of mango. <laughs> And they had good cooking. <laughs> Rices. They were great. And they were like they weren't uh, burgers. They lost their taste for burgers. The Vedic people had a big taste for burgers. They were cattle herders. Indra releases the cattle from the dragon and all this were try great myth. But then they are later they're like, you know, they're a bunch of vegans. No, no the Western vegan fanatics never mention. Or I've never seen one. Even my beloved, I love him. What's his name? Uh, Jeremy, who wrote Beyond Beef, and he wrote uh, The Empathic Civilization. I love that. Rifkin. I think Jeremy Rifkin, something like that. English guy. They never mention, you know, he, he talks about the disaster of the beef industry on the planet. You know, what an absolute catastrophe it is, you know. Because everybody wants to have it, and it's all that. Like, all that vegetable and protein gets stuffed into these poor victims and then they get slaughtered, right? The whole, the whole Holocaust, cow Holocaust that goes on. 
And, but then he never mentions that the India as a whole got rid of it. But then the Muslims brought it back, but, but India was not doing it. So how did they figure that out without reading Jeremy Rifkin? <laughs> without going to a Vedic, Vedic cafe in the East Village. Speaking Amen? of cafe and what? food. Oh, oh, it's too late. Oh, it's too late. I'm so sorry. Okay. Okay. Last thing. Tasyae Nama. Say. Tasyae Nama. Tasyae Nama. Namo Nama. Namo Nama. Now we're fine. <laughs> Thank you. This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, including special invites to trips around the world with Robert Thurman and geographic expeditions, please visit TibetHouse.us.